complicated by nature because it's a topic about compilers um, in, in essence. Few words about me. Um, I'm a software architect and apart the, the software architecture uh, stuff that I do on a daily basis, I also conduct technical trainings, especially on the performance and tuning to uh, topics and on software architecture. If you want to get more in touch with me, you can tweet, uh, there is my account and you can uh, check my, my website. As I was saying before to start, it's a difficult topic um, for, for a 50 minutes presentation. Also, the agenda contains a lot of topics, um, uh, as you can see. Uh, we will go through each of them and we'll try to reveal what's important out of this talk. It's basically the optimizations that are happening under the hood and also the patterns. So you have to, to take into account the patterns that that um, are present based on um, Java and C++ high-level code because under the hood I use two different compilers. For the um, uh, Java, on the Java side, from the just-in-time compiler perspective, I was using JIT C2, and on C++ um, it was LLVM Clang. This is a disclaimer just to remind you there is a lot of assembly in, uh, within, uh, in this presentation. However, I try to simplify as much as I could just to be less understandable in, in, in a presentation. And also, as I was telling you, it's important to understand the patterns each, each compiler relies on. What was my motivation to drive such kind of, of um, let's say, uh, experiment or research? Um, I was a big fan, I'm a big fan actually, of Richard Feynman. He wrote a book called The Pleasure of Finding Things Out, and this was one of my drivers. I was just curious what happens under the hood, and also I think that learn based on evidence driven by experiments is the best to, to do it yourself, to try right on, or, on your own. The key points out of this presentation um, is to, to reveal these optimizations that are triggered from different compilers' perspective. One at the runtime, the JIT C2 from Hotspot, and the other one on C++ side, LLVM Clang. And also, the, the aim is to to see how performance is one in regards with the other by or powerful by by this word by powerful or performant i don't mean to timings in essence because if you for example change the architecture or take another machine you might find slightly different results however by powerful in here i mean specifically to those patterns that each compiler relies on and also i don't intend to to make a battle out of this presentation. Uh, I don't try to establish a winner, just to study different approaches. Why this might be a matter of interest? First of all, because of performance. And why I took, for example, LLVM Clang, uh, it's a very interesting uh, AOT compiler and probably one of the best uh, from, from AOT World's compilers. And why I still uh, took a JIT C2, because you might um, saw, for example, Chris' presentations from Twitter, uh, they are using Graal a lot. So basically, I, I still uh, decided to take JIT C2 because in production most of our systems are based on hotspot and they are using JIT C2. I might, uh, I, I might uh, say that it's not quite a state-of-the-art compiler, however, it's one of the, the most used in, in production systems. And also Java is moving towards AUT. Uh, there is a JEP 295 which basically tries to offer support to, to compile ahead of time. The compilation process is very different. Um, on the Java side, um, we have initially the source code, which is compiled inside, it, which is basically translated to the bytecode. And then during the runtime, the interpreter kicks in. And once it becomes uh, hotspots, they are compiled. And at the end, we have the native code. On the other side, uh, for Clang perspective, there is C++ source code. Uh, and there are three stages, the front end 
extent, there is an optimizer and the code generation, uh, generator, and everything happens ahead. So once you, you kick in with that, um, for example, binary, it is already compiled. Now I want to share with you some of my methodology and what I learned because it's not easy to, to deliver such comparison, especially because uh, everything almost is dif different. Um, there is not quite apples to apples comparison. It's not the same source code. There are different languages like the Java and C++. Each language has its own specifics. Also the benchmarks that I, was, uh, I used are totally different, for example, in, in, on Java side, um, I use Java Micro Benchmark Harness on C++, C++ Google Benchmark, so different heuristics to optimize. Also, it's not fair to conclude out of this presentation that one is better than the other. Why? Because all that I did was on just one single machine, uh, and also um, I was using only one compiler. Uh, for example, on the Java side, there are many other compilers, state-of-the-art compilers like Graal, like Falcon, very interesting compilers. Also on C++, there is GCC, a very, very wonderful compiler. So that's why don't, don't take it like a battle. And also, in few cases, um, you will see there are timings like uh, two dot something nanoseconds versus two dot something nanoseconds. I would say fast enough, it's fast enough. Probably one or two milliseconds, it's not too much. And um, I, I really like this code from, from Cliff Click. This is all about the, the um, introduction part. Let's zoom inside the first test case, and it starts with um, computing the sum of n elements array. Basically, the code is pretty simple. Uh, we declare an array, and we iterate through the elements of those array, um, and we get the sum, and at the end, we return the sum. Um, as you might, might have spotted, the benchmark annotation comes from the GMH. So I, I created this sample, I run it, and um, here is the JITC2 code. As I was saying, it's, it's uh, a bit complicated. However, I tried to, to, to structureize it in order to be easier to be understood. First of all, what you have is basically um, the first two lines. Uh, it's the, the array and the array length. And then uh, what it does, um, it starts with so-called scalar pre-loop. This is a, a common tactic. For example, when you have loops, um, compiler them, uh, compilers, what they does, they peel the first or first iterations out of that loop. They, for example, um, that, that might be one, two, four, and so on, depend, uh, just uh, to, to be more cache friendly and to, to have a better, to, to align on the memory alignment. And in this case, it peels only the, the first uh, integer add, and then it continues with the main loop. So basically, our uh, loop itself was unrolled. What means unrolling? Basically, if you have a loop which it's based on, on a stride of one, so basically you increment one plus one plus one. Loop unrolling, it's a technique to... to uh, for example, a, um, duplicate the instructions inside statements inside that loop, and also uh, in this case uh, it's 16, and also to, to increment by 16. For example, the stride becomes 16. Why is this important? Because first of all, you minimize the number of, of um, jump instructions. It's 16 instructions at a time, um, and also you can benefit if those instructions are themselves uh, could be triggered in parallel. Uh, you can benefit of, of a better throughput. And in this case, my main loop was unrolled with a step of 16. So basically, 16 numbers were added per loop cycle. But of course, there might be remainings, because uh, if n um, length is not a multiple of 16, there is a remaining. And in this case, if this remaining is less than 16, uh, the, the last elements are added one by one until it reaches the, the n size. 
LLVM Clang, what it does, um, basically the same idea. However, there is an important difference. LLVM for the main loop, it uses vectorized operations. For example, um, it, it uses XMM registers. One XMM register um, contains 128 bits, uh, for ex uh, and uh, it could fit, for example, uh, four integers. And in this case, it is still un uh, unrolled, the main loop but it tackles 32 integer per loop cycle because there are eight additions and uh, because it uses XMM registers, um, each register can um, cover four integers. So 32 by 32 uh, in one loop cycle. And if there is a remaining, which is less than 32, but greater than eight, it still has a post loop, which is vectorized. So it, uh, it um, covers eight eight integers per cycle, and the last remaining, less than eight, for example, it's added one by one. If we have to uh, summarize what we saw until this point, so in case of GC2, it starts with a scalar pre-loop. It continues with the main loop uh, that does uh, 16 integers uh, per, per loop cycle, and it ends with the remaining in, in that scalar post-loop one by one until it reaches the, the length of the array. As opposite, LLVM Clang uh, has that vectorized main loop based on vectorized operation, which triggers 32, 32. Then if the remaining is less, uh, it continues with the vectorized post loop, eight integers per cycle, and the remaining it's, it's uh, that scalar post loop. In terms of timings, um, I test it with different array sizes, uh, as you can see in the left. Um, and in all cases, LLVM Clang behave better. Why? Because uh, it used the, the vectorized operations, um, which at this stage, for a specific, uh, for this specific case, just in time compiler, it's not using them. These are the conclusions that I was uh, telling you about. So basically, uh, LLVM Clang has the main loop, post loop, both vectorized, and the, the remaining uh, loop, it's, it's uh, scalar one by one. In comparison, GC2 still does this uh, loop unrolling stuff. It peels the first iterations out of the, the, the loop itself. However, it can't uh, outperform the LLVM clang. And the question is why? Why G uh, GC2 cannot do that? Because uh, um, in theory, it's, it should, right? And here is the answer. It was uh, in this specific case, uh, for this specific case, was explicitly disabled such optimization because, because the cost wasn't a benefit. So in essence, the, the code generated was, uh, was not so, um, so uh, performance. So they, they decided to disable vectorization for this specific case. And there is, there is um, this task in order to, to reconsider that uh, decision. However, because uh, some of you are Java developers, let's see some other cases where just-in-time compiler uh, triggers uh, or is, is based on vectorized operations. For example, when you add two arrays, uh, in this case, what we have, we have a setup method which initializes um, array A and array B, and um, array um, with uh, each uh, a uh, array, array sorry, uh, of i equals i plus 1, b equals b, uh, i plus 1, and in the hot method, there is c equals a plus b. So it's very simple. Um, if we benchmark this and if we zoom inside the, the, the loop itself, uh, you can see this time the, the main loop, it's, it's uh, based on vectorized operations. However, in this case, uh, it uses YMM register. So basically, on YMM register, spills across uh, 256 bits, and it can fit, uh, for example, like uh, eight uh, integers. And in this specific case, um, one loop cycle tackles 124 uh, integers because it uses 16 such operations and in each there is uh, an YMM register which basically um, it's able to con uh, contains uh, in essence eight integers. So uh, as you can see it's, it's very very efficient. 
Another case uh, where it does vectorization is uh, if you have an array and you add a constant to all those element uh, um, uh, arrays element uh, to all array elements. Sorry. The benchmark method, the one at the bottom, uh, you can see um, you iterate through that array, and for each element out of that array, you increment it by a constant. At the, the end, you return the array. Um, the profiling looks like this. Uh, it's very similar to the previous one. So uh, the main loop, it's, it's uh, unrolled. Uh, it uses vectorized operations. The same YMM register are used. And uh, in one loop cycle, it covers uh, 184 such, um, such operations. If we get back and summarize the, the um, pattern uh, that G2 relies on to, to do such uh, sort of, um, of um, optimizations, it starts with the scalar preloop. The scalar preloop, as I was saying, it's there to, to, uh, for, to better uh, pre-fill the, the CPU caches for memory alignment. It continues with the vectorized main loop and this vectorized main loop uh, previously, as we saw, it's able to cover, for example, 124 um, additions per cycle. And then the remaining, uh, it covers 8 by 8, but it's still vectorized. And the last scalar post loop tackles one by one until it reaches uh, the, the, the end, the length of the, the array, actually. In terms of comparison, uh, for different, um, for different uh, array sizes, in this particular case I tested with 10 of power of 9, both JITC2 and LLVM Clang um, perform almost the same because you can see the number of milliseconds per operation. For some array, array it's 61 versus 62, and for array and the constant, it's uh, 30 versus 31. So I'd say that fast enough it's fast enough. And the conclusion is that when both compilers rely on the same optimization uh, patterns like um, vectorization and loop unrolling, the, the performance is it's almost the same. The next case, it's a uh, sequential sum of n integers. What we have in here, um, we iterate basically from 1 to n, and we compute the sum of those uh, elements. So it, in essence, it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus until n, and we return that sum. How just-in-time compiler C2 uh, optimize this? Um, first, it's the similar pattern as we saw. It starts with this scalar preloop where it adds several integers per cycle and then continues with the main loop, which is unrolled. And in this case, it covers 16 such integers. So basically, in this main loop, it tackles 16, the next 16, the next 16, and so on, until there is a rem a remaining, and that remaining is less than 16, and it's tackled one by one until it reaches the end. In comparison, LLVM Clang, uh, surprisingly or not, it's not anymore using uh, the, the same mechanism. However, uh, because we know from mathematics, if you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus uh, until n, there is a reduction formula. And LLVM Clang uses that reduction formula. And uh, uh, this is the, the, all the assembly that is generated out of that, uh, that program. So in conclusion, there is no loop, and the optimization itself is it's called induction variable optimization. In, case, in terms of performance, LLVM Clang, uh, it's almost con uh, constant, uh, independent on N, because it's just a, a formula, right? However, GC2 depends on N. So bigger N is, uh, lower the performance is. And as you can see, uh, it was like one order of magnitude if we increase the, the N size. These are the conclusion that we already discussed about. So LLVM Clang, uh, the, the important thing is that it relies on that reduction formula and it's independent on N. As opposed to C2, uh, despite of the, the optimizations, peeling and rolling, it's not able to, to beat LLVM Clang. Uh, 
And the question is why GTC2 is not able to do that? Because you might have asked yourself. Uh, the answer is in this slide. I posted the question uh, for, for uh, OpenJDK guys, and they reply back saying that uh, hypothetically, GTC2 uh, could do that. However, it would need more advanced loop analysis. The optimization from LLVM is called scalar evolution and loop optimization, which in this uh, moment, it's missing from, from C2. And um, if I'm not wrong, it's still not in their target. Probably it will be added sometime um, in, in Graal, but I don't think uh, JIT C2 will, will be enhanced for this optimization. The next one is fields layout. And for the fields layout, we have three cases. The first case is about a um, very simple vanilla class, uh, Java class, which contains two shorts, X and Y. And um, analogous, I took a struct vanilla, which has the same fields X and Y. As you might know, in Java, there is the object header, um, which um, in this particular case, it's 12 bytes. Why it's 12 bytes? Because um, on 64 bits are uh, platform architectures, with compress loops, uh, the, the header, it's uh, 12 bytes. And then after these 12 bytes, um, X and Y, both fields are layout. So in total, the Java class has 16 bytes. As opposite, uh, the, the struct itself uh, has only four bytes. You might think, okay, there, there is a header also for, for structs when you, for example, uh, use malloc to alloc them. However, I didn't include that in, in the slide. Um, so let's, let's keep it simple, the, the, the vanilla struct uh, of having four bytes. And now let's move um, and let's see how those uh, objects are laid out inside the CPU. As we might know, the, the caching system of the CPU is hierarchical. And here it's uh, the L1 data cache. Um, in my case, uh, there are 32 K and uh, it is split in cache lines. So each cache line have 64 bytes. Um, and all um, in, uh, in total, there are 512 lines. Why it's important to, to understand that? Because um, we need to, to know how many objects from Java and C++ fit in one CPU cache line. And this is important because more objects you, you have in one CPU cache line, retrieving one, having the others on the same cache line, you don't have stalls, you don't have CPU cache misses. And getting back to our um, objects footprint, uh, the Java one have, uh, has 16 bytes and C++ struct has four bytes. Um, as conclude as a conclusion uh, the java for the java on the java side there are four such objects that fill in one cpu cache line and in c++ case there are around 16 such structs that fill in one cpu cache line and this is very important um, in in the timings that that we get but before that uh, let's zoom also inside the bench. Uh, the bench it contains just an array. It traverses the array and it does the sum x plus y all the times. And the figures are these ones. Um, LLVM Clang was uh, better, slightly better, I would say. Why? Uh, the explanation is in, in the memory, uh, in the object uh, uh, footprint itself. Uh, in case of Java, uh, the more, uh, less uh, such instances fill in one CPU cache line versus C++ struct, where are more. So uh, retrieving one, the, you have, for example, uh, the next 15 on the same cache line. In comparison with Java, roughly uh, speaking, if you uh, request the first one, you have the next three in the CPU cache line. So for the others, you might pay the cost of additional uh, CPU stalls, additional uh, cache misses. Um, that's why um, better um, uh, object layout, it's, uh, you are more cache friendly. The next one is uh, um, the same uh, objects. However, in this um, case, I took a sequence of 
eight longs. Uh, why eight longs? Uh, I recall one cache line needs 64 bytes, so eight longs uh, occupy one CPU cache line. And I, uh, in Java, I uh, declared X first, the next longs, um, and then Y. However, Java reorders the fields. Uh, the, the way you declare uh, the, in the class, it's not the way they are laid out at runtime in memory. Why is that? Um, I will get back in a second. It's roughly uh, to, to, um, uh, for a better um, object footprint. So as you can see in this particular case, uh, why it's reordered. Even if you declare after all of those longs, it is reordered and starts after uh, X. In case of C++, C++ doesn't do any reordering. However, it adds a padding before L0 because L0 uh, couldn't start at an address of, uh, of 4, for example. It should be an, at an address uh, multi multiple of 8. In total, the Java object takes 80 bytes and the C++ one takes 72. If we get back to our caches, um, for one CPU cache line, um, there is just one uh, Java object and one C++ track. However, what is important is that both X and Y sits on the same cache line because you can see here, X and Y are one next to each other. And the important thing is that requesting X Next, when you request why it is already in the CPU cache line. And this has an impact on the performance. The test is analogous, so basically I created an array and I did X plus Y and I returned the sum. And the, the, the figures are this one. So padding in both cases, um, the figures are almost there because there are almost the same number of CPU cache misses. Both uh, objects um, occupy, for example, one CPU cache line. So they are comparable in, in, in the way they lay out uh, on, the, on the CPU cache lines. The next one is um, fields layout, um, but in this case, I don't want, for example, Java to reorder my fields. And one technique to do that is to use subclasses. As we can see, uh, the base class, uh, it's extended by hierarchy, and in the hierarchy, I just uh, declared Y. And in this case, Java cannot reorder Y with the, all of those longs, because they belong to different classes. And um, as a result, uh, that we still have the header, there is X, the first field, and just before the first long from, from on the Java side, there is a padding because the fields should be typed aligned. So all the fields in Java are typed aligned. Because, uh, the long has um, eight uh, and should, should be at an address multiple of eight. And also, as you can see, the last one is Y, and there is a padding because the object themselves um, should be eight uh, byte aligned in this case. There could be also 16, but in this case, it's just one, uh, uh, just eight bytes uh, for the object alignment. C++, um, what it does, um, there is X without header, as we were saying. There is a padding before L0, and at the end, it's the, the Y, and it still adds uh, the, the last padding between 74 and 80. Why? Um, because it's the same story. The object itself should be aligned, uh, should be eight bytes aligned. From the CPU cache's perspective, um, the same. Uh, one CPU cache line can store one object on each side. However, there is an important difference in comparison with the previous case. Why? Because here X and Y fits on different CPU cache lines. So it's not like before. Before, when we requested X, we have Y. We had Y on the same cache line. Now, when we request uh, X, there is no guarantee Y it's already in the CPU cache. The benchmark is uh, the same, so we traverse the array and we do the, the multiplication for X and Y. And in terms of timings, slightly slower versus previous one, but still around the same values, which leads me to the conclusion that um, if, if both objects uh, are laid out in the, the same way, uh, the number of misses uh, and the number of CPU stalls are somewhere, somehow comparable. 
And we were talking about fields reordering, and we saw that the Java reorders the field. Basically, the, the uh, order you declared in your class, it's not the order for, from the, for the runtime. And now let's see what, what are the cases when uh, fields reordering can help and when it is dangerous. I'm talking about the Java case now. Fields reordering, it's good because it, it improves the overall object size. Um, by reordering the fields, uh, there is an efficient um, packaging, so the, the overall size is minimized, and also it prevents unaligned field access. As I was saying, in Java, fields are 8 bytes aligned, and the object itself uh, could be 8 bytes aligned. And also regrouping the fields so they fall on the same cache line. If there are only read operations, it's beneficial, as we saw in the, the, the second example, because retrieving one, you have the other on the same cache line. However, it's dangerous when you end up with full sharing problem. And um, the, the, who attended my yesterday talk, I discussed more in details about false sharing. Basically, false sharing is when both fields fall on the same CPU cache line, and there is at least one uh, reader, uh, writer, sorry, uh, because you need to get ownership on that CPU cache line and invalidate all the others. And um, in this case, with, if you uh, face false sharing problem, there is um, there is a, a penalty, so you pay the cost of this. However, also regrouping the fields uh, and they fall on different cache lines, so you have only reads, and if they are on different CPU cache lines, it's even, uh, even not efficient because you request first one and you expect the next to be in the same CPU cache line to read its value. However, it is not there, so you might end up with a another CPU store or another uh, uh, cache misses. So you need to be very, very careful with these fields reordering, depending on the object itself, what, what are the fields and how you access them. By accessing, I mean how to read and write on those. The next case is about null checks. Um, null checks is a very simple example. Um, I took a method and um, which basically receives an integer, and inside that method I say if that integer is not null, I multiply it by 42, otherwise I return it. As you can see, there is an explicit null check. However, in the compiled code, there is no um, explicit null check. Why is that? Because during the runtime, if you call a method which has an explicit null check, and if you call it with values which are not null, just-in-time compiler assumes they are not nulls, so it optimizes that in a way that it, the null check is uh, removed. However, if you later on call the method with a null value, what it does, it basically dispatches the execution to that address, and at that address is an uncommon trap. Basically, it's a routine which bails back into the interpreter, and later on it might be re-optimized again for both null and not null values. But if the just-in-time compiler sees there are only not null values, it basically removes the, the null check during the runtime. In comparison, NLVM Clang can't do that because it's, it's ahead of time. So as you can see here, it still keeps the, the null check, the explicit null check. There is a test. And if it is uh, null, for example, it, retur it returns 0, XOR EAX, EAX, it's basically that one. Otherwise, it multiplies the value with 42. In comparison, um, GC2 it's slightly better. Um, how, however, it's not a noticeable difference. Uh, in, in modern hardware, these kind of checks um, are not very, very uh, big. Uh, there is no difference in performance uh, unless you, for example, follow a branch, you are not predictable, and it end up in, I don't know, a few stalls. But other than that, there is no big difference in performance. So I would say that um, there are so even if LLVM Clang added the explicit null check, it's, it's almost irrelevant. 
So the conclusions uh, are these ones. LLVM Clang adds all, all the times the explicit check. Uh, JITC2 relies on this mechanism of leveraging if he it sees there are not null values. It optimizes that. And if, if the null happens, it relies on segmentation faults because basically what happens when you call something which is null, a segmentation fault is triggered. And um, that segmentation fault is caught by the JVM itself and the uncommon trap is hit and it bails back to the interpreter. If we, uh, uh, for example, uh, call the hot method with both null and not null values, initially it was called only with not null values. Um, the code is similar, the same method. You can see the JIT C2, uh, JIT, uh, C2 this time optimizes in the same way as LLVM Clang. So it explicitly adds the null check because JIT sees uh, both null and not null values during the runtime. So not any uncommon trap and it falls back to the classical way, the similar to, to what uh, LLVM Clang does. Performance figures, I would say fast, fast enough, it's fast enough. Uh, around 2.3 nanoseconds per operation versus 2 nanoseconds. However, um, just to, to remind you, we couldn't find a way, for example, in case of C++ Google Benchmark, to have nanosecond uh, decimal precision. So I would conclude there is not a big difference in performance. However, there is one scenario you should be aware of, and I uh, didn't spot that in, in my tests. Imagine you have a huge number of well-predictable branches in your code. Because just-in-time compiler, basically, if you follow all the times the, the same hot path, it removes um, and optimizes all of them. In LLVM uh, Clang, uh, it reaches uh, or it phase the hardware uh, predictor limit. And in this case, uh, Java could, uh, just-in-time compiler actually, could um, perform uh, incredibly better in comparison with LLVM Clang because this optimization happens at the just-in-time compiler as opposite to LLVM Clang, which leverages on, on the CPU uh, branch predictor. So this is a very important remark. Local lesion. Uh, the next one, um, it's um, somehow um, uh, a stupid uh, way of writing a method. Why is that? Uh, imagine you have a method and you declare an object, you instantiate the object, and you have a, a lot of redundant and useless synchronized locks uh, uh, lock, uh, on, on a uh, um, local sorry, reference. And uh, as you might spot, uh, there is no contention even if multiple threads are calling the same method because everything is local and it happens to uh, inside the, the thread frame itself, there is no contention. So each thread will have its own local copies. So um, it's, it's almost irrelevant to, to use those synchron synchronized blocks. And just in time compiler, it's able to, to detect that. And as you can see in the generated code, you, there is no synchronized block. Everything is added sequentially, no any synchro uh, locking, um, let's say, um, no any uh, synchronized block. In comparison, LLVM Clang, it's not able to detect that. And LLVM Clang uses all the, the locking and unlocking blocks for nine times, and in the last one, it just uh, do the, the all additions and returns. In terms of performance, um, LLVM Clang, it's, um, it's slower, um, of course, and it's dependent on the number of useless synchronized blocks. JITC2, because it removes all of them, um, the, the, the performance is it's way uh, better. The conclusions um, are, um, in case of LLVM Clank, it's not able to spot this kind of situations. However, just-in-time compiler benefits of uh, built-in synchronized semantics uh, present at the language level. Uh, because Java has a very well, um, uh, very, very good uh, such semantics, just-in-time compiler takes advantage out of them, and it's able to remove all of those synchronized blocks. 
Virtual calls. The next example it uh, contains basically three subcases. The first one starts uh, with a base class, the shape one, which has a triangle uh, as just one implementation. So shape declares a method, the compute method, and triangle extends shape and overrides the method compute. The code uh, that I used it's on the on the left side. So I create an instance of triangle and I have a method compute which receive that instance and does actually a multiplication. Multiplication between the parameter which is 3 and a constant which is 17. You, you see that the benchmark method at the bottom. If we want to, to, to run that and test it, um, here is the generated code, and as you can see, even if we called, I mean the previous one, even if we call the compute method in the generated assembly code, there is no uh, any virtual call. Why is that? Because during the runtime, just-in-time compiler saw only one uh, implementation for that shape, so it was unable uh, to inline and to devirtualize that call in a sense. So as you can see, no virtual call, everything is inlined, um, and also no uncommon trap was added, like we, we saw in the null check example. LLVM Clang in this case um, was not able to do the same or analogous optimization. He still needs to, to, for example, to move the control to the virtual call. So it passes the triangle um, and it takes the parameter and uh, uses the, the virtual call. So um, in this case, it uses virtual table in order to detect the implementation during the runtime. It's not able to optimize in the same way. The performance is somewhere um, so not, not big in essence, uh, however slightly, slightly better in case of, of GC2. And this case of, um, of methods that have only one target, in, uh, possible target uh, implementation are called monomorphic. So in this case, that's why I was saying there was a monomorphic call. It was a call that has uh, or had only one possible target um, invocation. The next case is where we have two such uh, possible target invocations. For example, you have the shape and you have the triangle and rectangle. So basically two classes that extend the shape. And the benchmark is similar. Um, we declare actually two instances and we call compute of shape one with the parameter plus compute of shape two with the same parameter. So at the end it basically returns a sum. In this case, the just in time compiler, because it realizes there are two possible um, implementations. Uh, as you can see, the assembly it's, it's slightly complicated, but um, what it does, it checks for the rect rectangle for the first implementation. If it is rectangle, it does the multiplication. If it is the second implementation, triangle, it still does. However, if it is another one, Probably during the runtime we load another implementation and we load another class and we instantiate it. There is the same mechanism present for null checks. It hits the uncommon trap and deoptimizes everything. So basically, what it does, it is enabled, it is able to inline both target implementations for um, rectangle and triangle. And if you call the same method with another one, with a third one, it hits the uncommon trap and uh, deoptimizes, and probably later on it, it reoptimizes again, based, uh, depending on, on the, the path uh, and how you call the method later on, with, uh, based on which uh, instances. LLVM Clang, um, it's similar to, to what it did before. Uh, it b b actually triggers the virtual call uh, twice, uh, once for the triangle compute and the second one for rectangle compute, and at the end it returns the sum. So uh, in this case, uh, where uh, even um, LLVM Clang for two target invocation was not able to perform any optimization. So it uh, went through the uh, vtable look up in order to, to get the implementations and, and call them. 
In terms of figures, biomorphic calls, because there are two possible target implementations, JITC2, still slightly better, but again, not a big discrepancy between those two. The last uh, subcase, it's the case with three target invocations, where here, uh, besides triangle and rectangle, we add the squares of the third possible implementation. And our test compute method um, contains now three computes, three calls to, to compute method each one receiving an instance of the shape, and it, it does uh, what it does, it multiplies that uh, parameter, which is three, with a constant. So at the end, it returns a sum. And in this case, uh, surprisingly or, or not, uh, just-in-time compiler doesn't do any optimization. It performs the virtual call. As we can see here, it calls uh, involve virtual compute. So no optimizations as we saw for the previous two cases, monomorphic and bimorphic. And no any un uncommon trap. So it doesn't do, in essence, any optimization. LLVM Clank um, is similar. Um, it uh, calls three times, three virtual calls, passing the parameters. So the first one, triangle compute, the next one, rectangle compute, and the last one, square compute. And at the end, it adds uh, the, the result and returns the result. So three target invocations still uses VTable to perform the virtual call, um, similar to, 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 um, uh, to JITC2 in this case. In case of timings, uh, JITC2 around 8.1 nanoseconds per operation, LLVM Clang a bit better, um, but again, it's Still, still, um, the patterns are the same. They they were using under hood, the hood virtual calls. Um, to me, it's not something very, very much in difference. Um, however, um, the the important notice is out of this um, uh, scenario is why just in time compiler it's not able to do starting with the third possible implementation. It's not it, it doesn't optimize uh, at all. And this case it's called polluted profile case. What means polluted profile? So basically, it's similar to what we had when you change the context from one to another um, target. Uh, implementation and you have independent operand types, this, it's, uh, this relates to a polluted profile. And to solve this polluted profile, there are many solutions. One of them is to create context-dependent split profiles. And in regards to that context-independent split profile, there is um, an OpenJDK task um, to enable that. However, it is targeted for, for JDK 13. So until that time, we will still struggle with virtual calls. After this will be implemented, probably it will be um, by having uh, split profiles, uh, we will be able to, to do the optimization also after or starting with the third possible implementation. But until that time, it's still not possible. Uh, only in, in the hotspot uh, JITC2. I don't talk about any other compilers because, for example, Falcon is able to do that. The next case, it's and the last one, it's scalar replacement. Um, scalar replacement, it's an interesting optimization uh, able to preserve the, the heap, um, the heap allocations. Uh, what we have here, we uh, at the bottom, we declare an uh, object uh, called wrapper, which have two fields, X and Y. Uh, in the constructor, we, we initialize them, and we have the, the, bench met, the benchmark method, hot method, which which basically creates an instance and returns uh, w.x plus uh, w.y. As you can uh, easily spot, the, the instance, the, uh, to allocate an instance is completely useless because we allocate an instance, we do the, the sum, and we return the sum. So the, the instance is basically um, for nothing. 
However, just-in-time compiler is able to spot that based on the scope, and um, as we can see, there is no allocation on the heap, uh, only uh, a sum between x and y is triggered, and the result is returned in EAX register. LLVM Clang does the same um, based uh, based on the, on the scope of the object. Uh, he preserved the, uh, the the heap allocation and just does x plus uh, plus y. In terms of figures, both uh, are relying on the same um, techniques, so um, the, the figures are almost there. Fast enough, it's fast enough, I'd say, also in this case. So these are the conclusions uh, for this, um, this um, Scala replacement test scenario. Uh, it is enabled by default in Hotspot, um, so you can benefit of it uh, without uh, starting the, the JVM with any additional parameter. And the final conclusions out of this talk are uh, starting with LLVM Clang. Uh, as you can see, LLVM Clang is it's incredibly smart compiler. Even ahead of time, it was able to, to do a lot of optimizations. Like, for example, some uh, between 1 and n uh, integer. The Scala replacement was a nice one. JITC2 uh, still uh, strong uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, it was very good in terms of lock elision. Also, Lock coercioning is, is, um, works on the same optimization patterns. Um, and also, it was able, uh, based on the, the language semantics, to remove the unnecessary synchronization blocks. And for the virtual calls, in case of monomorphic and bimorphic, it was able to, to trigger beautiful optimizations to inline uh, and to add uncommon traps. And uh, when both compilers rely on the same techniques like loop unrolling and vectorized operations, uh, the performance is almost there. So actually, it's not a big discrepancy in performance. Basically, the patterns, uh, how they optimize the code and the vectorized operation patterns in, in some cases. And in closing, because I, I started with a Richard Feynman quote, I'd like to, to end in the same way. Uh, um, and I really like uh, this. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, how smart you are, who made the guess, or what is his name. If he disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That's why during the entire talk, I try to reveal the, the optimizations under the hood just to prove what is happening. Special thanks to my to my colleague George, which is a C++ senior developer, because he spent a lot of time to me writing the code and, and do the assembly analysis. And thank you all for attending this talk. Hope it was interesting and you find out some 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 important takeaways. Thank you so much. We have time only for one two questions, so. Hi, uh, I have a question about the last, I think it was the last benchmark where it, the object was created and then the sum returned of the parameters. Uh, for LLVM case, uh, for C++, uh, it, it was actually a call to a new or a stack allocation because you didn't show the code, so. Yeah, 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 I didn't include the, the um, yes. Uh, I think it was only a stack allocation. It was new. It wasn't new. Yeah, it was a stack allocation. Thank you. Yeah, because if it is new, I don't think it, it's able to do that. I think, I think it's not allowed to do Yes, that. exactly, yes. And one more? And I think we are good. Thank you. Thank you so much.